Luke chapter number 4. Hallelujah. Y'all might ought to be careful. I should have warned you, sent out a text message to pack a lunch. Because when I get excited and I come back refreshed, all refreshed and excited, uh, there ain't no telling what I might cut loose with. Brother Chitwood sends his regards, spoke to him for a little bit. He said to tell you, hello, Brother McKinney. And is it with Sandy? He said to, to tell you all uh, hi and he's been thinking about you. Amen. Saw a lot of, lot of folks. Amen. And I'm excited. Most, most wonderful things I saw the Lord move abundantly. Amen. I felt it. I was a part of it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And verse 19 says, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now the background for this lesson is, this message today that, that we've got in the Bible, is that Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now there's a strong uh, a feeling among the world, especially people that believe in God, and some of them will go to the mat wanting to fight with you and tell you, I don't believe you have to go to church to be saved. But I come to tell you, if you're going to be a Christian, you'll go to church. Say what? Well, because the word mean, Christian means a follower of Christ or to be Christ-like, and Jesus Christ was a regular churchgoer. Amen? Amen. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his custom. And he, because of some things that have been happening in Capernaum and some other cities, he is in his hometown. He is in Nazareth in this particular instance. And in a few other places as well as Capernaum, he, is, he has become a, a, a teacher or a preacher of note. And so when he comes to his, his home church, he is asked to, to stand up and read the scriptures. It was a common practice to ask a visiting rabbi or a teacher to read a selected portion of Scripture. Now, the Scriptures were read at every meeting. Every time they came together, they read a set portion of Scripture, and over a period of time, invariably, everyone heard the entire Word of God. Brother Pete, it was a, a, a law. It was something you had to do to listen to the word be read. And over a period of time, you would hear the entire law be read, the entire word be read. It was a part, just a, a portion, a, a, a ritual portion of their service. And this passage that Jesus read had undoubtedly been read hundreds, if not thousands of times before. Because it is found in Isaiah chapter number 61. And until this day that Jesus reads it, this scripture has always been read as a prophecy, as something that was going to happen down the road. But never before had it been read by the one that it was written about. There was a prophetic utterance of the coming Messiah who was Jesus Christ. The one that it was written about was the one reading the word. Now the Lord dealt with me on Tuesday. On, on the way up to camp uh, general conference before that I heard any preaching or, or any teaching, anything that would try to help me. And, and I know that there are several among us uh, when I go through the prayer list and when I walk down the aisles and, and I call your names out in prayer, there are many that worship with us, that come to church faithful with us, uh, that you need the promises that are given in these scriptures. Uh, and, and as I thought about it, I decided, Brother Pete, that when I got back, uh, I was going to preach from this passage. Uh, and I might be going to preach from this passage more than one time a month because people need to realize that God is a deliverer, that God is a healer, that God is a restorer. I'm sick and tired of people staying like they are. I'm ready for the Holy Ghost to be able to invade some people's life and set them free. So I went to a church growth seminar while I was up there and there were many things mentioned that are going to be helpful to our church. 
I bought, I bought uh, close to $300 worth of Bible studies and Bibles and materials uh, to help our church. Uh, but uh, one thing in particular inspired me. Uh, not only did it inspire me, but it convicted me. Uh, and it is from that inspiration and conviction that I bring this word to you today. Jesus read, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I almost, uh, almost, Brother Billy, just wanted to stop right there. Because whatever we accomplish, uh, it's not because we get a good idea. It's not because we dress the right way. It's not because we even come to church. Uh, it will be by the Spirit of the Lord. Anything that happens, we are a spirit-filled church. We are a spirit-motivated church. We're a spirit-looking church. We're seeking and looking for the presence of the Lord all the time. I'm not interested in having, I, I like fellowship and I like friendship and I like being in church with you. But I'm not coming here no more if we don't feel the presence of the Lord. It's not by Mike nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said. And here's the reason why the spirit is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The good news of Jesus Christ to those that are hum humble, those that are meek, it is the poor in spirit that he's talking about. To those who are aware of their need, what, there's two ways you become aware of your need. One is by hearing the preacher tell you what you got to do to change. And the other is, it's because there's an emptiness in your soul. Because there's something lacking. There is a need in your life that mandates, I have no hope except what Jesus offers. Here's what the gospel says or does, Jesus said. He said, I've come to heal the broken hearted. Those that are presently hurting, whether emotionally or physically, the Lord came to heal you. He said, I come to preach deliverance to the captives. Say, I'm not bound. Well, you may be. Those who are captive, bound by addiction, bound by affliction, Bound by generational curses. How many of you know we got a lot of that around here? I've had a young man tell me, I've preached to you before. He told me, he said, my daddy was no good, my grandpa was no good, and I ain't going to be no good either. It's something people just, just think that it's their lot in life. But Jesus said, that's not the message I preach. I'm glad to tell you that's not the message Jesus preaches. That's not the message I preach. I preach that you can be changed and you don't have to wait till next week. You can be changed today. Instantaneous change by the power of the Holy Ghost to deliver the captives. Can I tell you that the Lord wants to deliver you from poverty? Can I tell you that the Lord wants to deliver you from the effects of your bad decisions? He came to preach deliverance to the captives. And then he said, I came to preach the restoration of sight to the blind. And that's those who can't see the light of truth, whose residence is the darkness of an unfulfilled life. They walking very gingerly. You know what happens when you get up in the middle of the night? Even in a familiar room, when it's pitch black and dark, you don't just jump out of bed and run to the bathroom. You feel your way along a little bit. Even How many even in you, the familiarity of your house, uh, you've turned too sharp and, and run into a wall? I have. You've turned too sharp and stubbed your toe. We got to have light uh, to be able to see where we're going. And the Lord doesn't want you to stay blind. Oh, I could have myself a fit right now. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Just like the blind man that God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. 
I saw, I'm so glad one day, Brother Pete, uh, that the Holy Ghost got on me. And it wasn't because I had a good mom and a good daddy or a good grandma and a good grandpa. It was because the Holy Ghost got in me and the revelating power of the Holy Ghost uh, began to lead my life. I'm glad I saw the light. Not a light that Mr. Edison invented, but the light that shines out of the throne room of heaven into my life. And the Bible says, he sets at liberty them that are bruised. And that's those whose lives have been shattered or broken by calamity or by disaster or by tragedy. And he said, I've come to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now this acceptable year of the Lord refers to the year of Jubilee that we find in the book of Leviticus. The year of Jubilee, Brother McKinney, was the 50th year. And it was a year of restoration. Three things were to happen in the year of Jubilee. Liberty would be given to all who were in bondage. There was to be a return of all ancestral possessions to those who had been forced to sell them due to poverty. So if you had a piece of ground and the, there was two or three bad years of crops and your family was going hungry and you were forced to sell your ground to pay your bills or to feed your family or to put a roof over your head, in the year of Jubilee, that ground came back to you. And the third thing is, is there was to be a year of rest for the land. No crops were planted. They were to live on what grew on its own from the previous year. Another way to describe that, Brother Billy, they were to live on what God grew. What grew from nature. It is not clear. Historically, it is not very clear whether the Jews ever really observed. Now stay with me now. Come on. I'm going to hang a curtain up over here. It's amazing. By virtue of getting up and walking out, they become more important than the Word of God. I'm sorry, baby. It's not clear that the Jews ever practiced it. It's kind of hard when somebody says, you get a good deal on a piece of property to turn right around and give it back to them, Brother Billy. So it's not clear whether the Jews ever really observed that, and that shouldn't come as any surprise to us because they didn't observe a half of what he gave them. Huh? It is made clear, however, by Jesus Christ that these things are no longer a promise to be read in a book but by the coming of Jesus Christ are now reality to whosoever will believe. <laughs> Notice this, Luke 4, 20. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister, to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now you got to understand something. The Jews were a, a, a people steeply enriched in tradition. They had to do things the set way every service, every time. But Jesus has just read a prophetic scripture that no doubt they have heard any time, many times before. But if you remember, the way Jesus began his talk was, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now the Bible said Jesus closed it and sat down. And the eyes of everybody in the synagogue were locked on him. This familiar passage of Scripture must have had a new ring to it coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ. The anointing is upon him. 
which is the essential ingredient necessary for preaching this message of hope. I'm not just coming here to recite something to you that you'll continue to believe in and continue to hope for and just read and read and read. I come today to tell you that this power I'm reading about is ready to be revealed in your life. That the power of the Holy Ghost is ready to operate in this way in your life. And he began to say unto them, Oh, I'm going to preach today. Y'all just well hold on. You're going to find out why. My eyes have been opened. You're about to find out why. And he began to say unto them, This day. Everybody say this day. I'll take that. Is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? So I got to ask you the question, and, and I've taught this before, at least this part of it. Why their ears? Why is the scripture fulfilled in their ears? Because Romans 10 and 17 says, So then faith cometh by, and hearing by the word of God. Faith is given birth to when you hear the word of God just spoke to you. The promises in the word of God, all you got to do is stop letting it be something somebody recites to you and let it be something that gives life inside of you, something that gives birth to hope, something that gives birth to possibilities. Faith is an essential element in receiving anything from God. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, the correction I received from this elder at General Conference was this. The reason why I wanted to preach this message, the reason why that this scripture kept coming back to me is because, Brother Pete, whether through the Holy Ghost or through word of mouth or through my own two eyeballs, there are many people that are battling what I'm preaching about. Brokenhearted, bruised, blind, captive. And so, Sister Maria, all I can do is, my God, help me right now. It's Brother Pete, as I'm, as I'm praying, I'm saying, Lord, show me their problems so I can preach and help them with them. Oh, that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? That's the way I've been thinking. Until an elder who has already been through this growth process spoke a word of wisdom into my life. He didn't know he was doing it because the room was packed. People were standing all around the walls. You folks got to go with me next year. You have got to. I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. Start saving your pennies today. He said, stop preaching to their problems and start preaching to their potential. Stop letting what they are dictate your message and let it be dictated by what they're going to be. Stop preaching by sight and begin to preach by faith. Stop preaching to their present and start preaching to their future. Stop preaching to their reality and start preaching to their faith. 
There are people bound by affliction, bound by addiction, and bound by attitudes. Beaten down with the cares and struggles of life. Scarred with the wounds of years of abuse and mistreatment. uh, Bruised with the tragedy that life brings. But I cannot preach into your problem anymore. What I've got to begin to do is preach into your faith. I've got to preach to those who are going to preach the gospel. Who those are going to teach home Bible studies. uh, To those who are going to win souls. uh, To those who are going to pastor churches. uh, To those who are going to evangelize. uh, To those who are going to start a jail ministry. Those are going to go witness in the crack alleys. uh, And the list goes on and on and on. Uh, I've got to stop magnifying where you are and begin to preach where God's going to take you. Oh, don't you just clap, 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 clap because I got a little loud. You clap, clap, clap because you grasp a hold of it and realize God's got big plans for me. Because, Brother Chris, I begin to think about it. I preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering of sight to the blind. Setting at liberty them are bruised. All these miraculous things are going to happen in people's lives. But then a big question popped out. Oh, I wish I could preach this morning. I wish I could feel the liberty. I want to just, boom, give a bonic elbow right between the devil's eyes. Because I begin to ask myself this question, Brother Kendall. After they're delivered, after they're healed, after they're restored, then what? Then what? It is a proven fact. The Lord led me to this. I don't have it in my notes, so you have to forgive me. Brother Robbie, he's a student of history. And understand that in no way do I intend to be offensive. This is to prove a point. But in 1863, 2, the Emancipation Proclamation was given. 63 which was demanded by the federal government that all slaves were to be freed. But when they freed them, Brother McKinney, they ran into a problem. They were set free, but they wouldn't leave because that was all they knew. You hear me now? It is a fact, it is a verifiable statistical fact that one in three people that spend time in prison will return there within three years. It's even, we went to Angola and visit, they even sell t-shirts. I'm I'm not going to step on her. If I do, it won't hurt her. I'm in the Holy Ghost. We used to go to Angola and they would sell t-shirts, Brother Pete, that said three hots and a cot. Because that became, oh, I'm going to preach to somebody right now. If you'll just hold on a second. Because they had become so familiar, so accustomed to being in bondage that they did not know how to act being set free. And I feel in the Holy Ghost that I'm preaching to some people that you want to that you want to that you want to believe that you can be delivered. You want to believe that your eyes can be opened. You want to believe you can be set at liberty. But when it happens, what am I going to do? I've become so used to being beat down. I've become so used to have to always fight. I've become so I've become so used to to getting out of bed in the morning and strapping on all my weapons because I know I got to go through this day and keep on fighting the same battle. But I come to tell you, saints of God, the first key to you being delivered is seeing yourself delivered. And being delivered, the thing that you've got to see yourself be delivered is why did God deliver me? He didn't deliver me. You hear me right now. He didn't deliver me to put a feather in his cap. He didn't deliver me so he could say, one more I won from the devil. 
No, he delivered me so I could be a mighty soldier in the kingdom of God. He delivered me so I could be hell's worst nightmare. He delivered me so I could cast out devils, so I could lay hands on the sick and they recover. He didn't deliver me so I could be another number on the board. He delivered me so I can be triumphant along with him. He didn't deliver me so I could be a statistic. He delivered me because the Bible said you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and then you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. He didn't bring me out so I could just kick back, sit back, fold my arms and say I've arrived. He brought me out to, so I could wade off into somebody else's personal hell and speak the word of redemption, speak the word of liberty by faith. By faith. Because if he can do it for me, he will do it for them. Phone started ringing. Can here you go. I've been Tuesday night, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Unbelievable miracles, signs, and wonders. People getting the Holy Ghost. People, I watched people. The preacher said they could be healed. I watched one old bald headed fellow step out of his seat and run at the fast as he could to the altar because his faith was that strong. Said they could be healed. I'm pumped, Brother Pete. I'm primed and I'm ready to go. This morning, first thing, the phone starts ringing. Can't come, I'm sick. Can't come, I'm sick. Get text messages. This one's sick. That one's sick. And you know what the devil does? Told you. But you know what I got to do, Brother Pete? Is I got to shake off that junk. And I got to remind him I used to be bound, sucker. But I've been set free. I used to be blind. But now I see. You better come with something more than that. You better bring something more than just a little bit of discouragement. Because I'm not preaching to the church I see today. I'm preaching to the church you, that the Lord showed me down the road. I'm not preaching to, 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 to sight today. I'm preaching by faith. I'm preaching to full pews. I'm preaching to Holy Ghost filled believers. I'm preaching to black and white and red and yellow. I'm preaching to rich and poor. I'm preaching to drug addicts and lawyers. I'm preaching by faith to the church that God is going to give us. I ain't preaching to this Sunday. I'm preaching to eternity. By faith. By faith. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder. Of them that diligently seek him. I come to tell you today to look beyond where you are. Look to the reason why he called you out of darkness. Into this marvelous light. You can only see that by faith, saints. You can only see that by faith. These scriptures weren't meant to be inspirational. These scriptures weren't something meant to make you feel good. They are meant to be taken as truth because that's what they are. John 17, 17 says, Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That word sanctify means set apart. What I'm trying to do in the Holy Ghost this morning is to tell you you've been, just because of being here and feeling the power of the Holy Ghost, you've been set apart. Not to just come out of Egypt, but to go into the promised land. Not just to be delivered and set free today, but the Lord's concerned what you're going to do for him tomorrow. So I'm a preacher of faith. A preacher of faith. If we get drugged down in our present circumstances, we'll never get out of them. But the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Acts 3 and 12, Brother Shannon. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, you men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness 
we had made this man to walk. This is, the, this is Peter's message. After the lame man at Gate Beautiful is told, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, Brother Chris, and immediately his feet and ankle bones regained strength. And he, <laughs> leaping, running, walking into the synagogue, into the house of the Lord. Then Peter saw that people begin to run from everywhere to see what happened. The lame man's not lame anymore. As though by our own power of holiness we had made this man walk. Don't be thinking it's about us, Peter said. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. The God of our fathers had glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and you killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses. Keep that in mind. We are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Faith. Faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Why do they have faith in the name of Jesus Christ? Because they saw him resurrected from the dead. Now, the ultimate destination for the captives, for the blind, for the bruised, for the afflicted, and for the poor is death. But faith in the resurrecting power of the Holy Ghost brings life. And what this faith I'm preaching to you about today, this faith I'm preaching to you about today will result in you being made perfect. Say, well, uh, nobody's perfect. How many be honest and say that just ran through your mind when I said that? There's a couple. Nobody's perfect. Well, guess what? I agree with you. We make mistakes. We think stupid things. We say stupid things. It just happens. We're humans. That ain't what this is talking about. It's talking about deliverance to the captive. Heal the brokenhearted. Giving of sight to the blind. Setting at liberty them that are bruised. And preaching the acceptable year of the Lord. This faith I'm preaching to you this morning. This message where, where I'm preaching into your possibilities. Will do you no good if you don't grasp a hold of it and believe it. If you don't believe it can happen to you. And for you. But you've got to hear the word. And you've got to believe the word. And it is the will of God to restore everything the devil took from you. They are witnesses of the resurrection. They saw him die and they saw him live. So their lives became witnesses of the resurrection. And coming back from the dead, he carried the keys of death and of hell. And Brother Rice, he came out of that tomb bringing us a gift. Yeah, he brought the gift of the Holy Ghost to us. But the gift that I've got to preach to you about this morning, he brought us the gift of hope. He brought us the gift of hope. Because hope that's seen is not hope. Remember how Hebrews chapter number 11? The Bible said these all died in faith, having received not the promise. These all died in faith. They refused to be identified by what they are and instead chose to be identified by what they were going to be. Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. That by two immutable 
That word immutable means unchangeable, unaffected. There is nothing in this world or the heavenly world or the hell world that can change it. In which it was impossible for God to lie. We believe, we don't have no problem believing the promises of God for somebody else. Where we have the problem at is seeing them applied to the man in the mirror. Now, I know what God can do for them, but I've just done too much. That's a lie straight out of hell. The devil wants you to believe that. You know, Brother Wayne Huntley testified at General Conference, Brother Pete. Many of you don't know who he is. Many of you will. One of the most prolific preachers, unbelievable preacher. Pastors a church in, in Raleigh, North Carolina that runs way up there close to 1,000, I think, six, 800 people. But you know what, Brother Terry, he told us? He said he grew up about two blocks from their church in Charlotte, North Carolina. He said the preacher gave him a key to the church house because his dad was a raving alcoholic. And his mom would have to get him and his little brother and sneak him out of the house at night. They would go to the church and sleep on the church pews because their daddy was threatening to kill him in a drunken stupor, raising a butcher knife at him. This is a man who is so dignified and, and articulate and educated. And he said, I love the church because it's the church that came a symbol of refuge for me. There's people, you don't know the folks that are among you right now that came right out of the armpit of hell. You don't know the people among you right now that have sat on the edge of their bed with tears pouring down their face with a rubber band stuck in their mouth as they shoot up heroin or, or some other type of drug into their veins. You don't know the people that have stowed their grocery money and went and bought drugs with it with their families sitting at home and their bellies growling. But you know the beautiful thing, Brother Pete, is that's who they used to be. Because somewhere, somehow, some way, they begin to see themselves as God intended for them to be instead of how they are. And if you can just grasp a hold of what God wants for you, if you'll just be quiet long enough to hear him speak into your life, you can be anything. You can be anything. Do all preach? Nope. Do all teach? Nope. Do all sing and play instruments? Nope. But you are all members in particular. And I've come to tell you the very first, the most important thing in this church having the blowout revival is some people grasping a hold of a calling that says I'm a worshiper. I'm a worshiper because that's what the drummer is. That's what the guitar picker is. That's what the piano. Oh, yeah, we got to have good music to sound good. But let me tell you something. Somebody that's got their heart right can get up there with their fist and start clubbing on that piano, and the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost will sweep across this place and sweep across them because they are a worshiper. And that's how it begins. And ministries are given birth to in the delivery room of worship. If you begin to worship him. I don't have this in my notes either. Talked about it a little bit. But the Bible said you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness. The old song said, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Because you see, I was in a battle one day, and I was losing. But somebody called my name out in prayer, and he reached out. 
and thank God he didn't judge me because of what I was. He delivered me because of what he knew I could be. He knew, saints of God, we have got to quit talking, living, and preaching about our problems. And begin to talk, live, and preach about our possibilities. Oh, let me tell you something. I see some people. There, there's at least one of you here this morning. I watched you walk in the door. As soon as I did, the Holy Ghost quickened to me and said, there's a beginning of a revival. There's a beginning of a revival. Oh, we see people come in. We smell people come in. Thank God. Thank the Lord. I love it. I love it. Because, you, saints, you've got the you people that have been with us, you know, when we started... Brother McKinney maintained. Brother McKinney stayed faithful. But you see, I've been preaching for months. The very people I've been telling you were going to come, they're here. They are here. Oh, come on. Look what the Lord has done. We're not where we were, but bless God, we're not where we're going to be either. We're not where we were, but we're not where we're going to be either. Man taught a class, Brother Billy. He pastors in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but a rural area. He said that recently... They seat 187 in their church. That's how many they seat. That's how many seats are available, 187. They they had goats. They had goats tethered up in their backyard, a donkey in somebody's front yard across the street. They're in a rural country area on a dead-end road. Started the church from nothing 10 years ago. They average 352 people in attendance every Sunday. They have had over 500 people on three occasions. 500 people in a sanctuary at one time that seats 187. All I can begin to think as he started talking was that's us. That's us. That's us. We can seat uh, anywhere from 275 to 300 if you bring a bunch of babies and you lay them in the floor. Oh, God. You can't hurt my feelings by thinking I'm a dummy. You can't hurt my feelings by laughing and ridiculing. You can't hurt my feelings by talking about me around your supper table about that fool up there preaching because I come to tell you that's what I want uh, is people laughing. I want people amazed at the vision that the Lord has given us. I want people thinking I'm kooky as a cuckoo clock. I want people talking and laughing and thinking, who does he think he is? Who does he think what's going on? There's going to be people come write us checks for $10,000, $20,000. There's going to be people showing up in here and sitting on this pew right here that will blow your mind. We're so bad. We are terrible. I am the world's worst. I'm a romantic. I'm nostalgic. I love talking about the good old days. We're the world's worst. Talking about how it used to be. But Brother Terry, if we can ever start talking about how it's going to be. If we can ever start dreaming. And you know what the Bible says? Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask. Sister Margaret. Let me tell you something. I'm about half crazy. I really am. I'm nuttier than a fruitcake because I can see a thousand people filled with the Holy Ghost in the city of New Madrid. Oh, listen to me. Listen to me. Come on. I drove last night and I decided I'm just going to pray for every house that's got some kind of connection to us. 
Brother Mark, almost every house on every street, either one of their relatives, or they used to go to church here, or they work with somebody that goes to church here, or they're related to somebody that goes to church here. Brother Billy, you know what? Why can't we just win them all? Polly been telling me she was going to come church here for five or six years. Thank God she came this morning. You've been telling me a long time, had you? I'm glad you came, Polly. I really am. I'm happy you came, Polly. Uh, I am. I'm thank happy you, you came to church. I sure am. Poor old Lacey's been putting on Facebook. Y'all better not let her put more good stuff about our church on Facebook than you do. Every service we leave out of here, honey, she, she goes up and starts bragging on our church. Sometimes one, two, three, four, five posts in a row. Let me tell you something. I'm done. I'm done. I got some more notes, but I'm done. I just got to make you see, or I just got to pray that God will let you see what I see. I got to let you pray. The folks that's coming from Sykeston, they've had some obstacles thrown in their path, some decisions they got to make. Brother Shannon and I, we talked about it, discouraged. The church they used to go to is really putting a lot of pressure on them. You know what I said, Brother Terry? Ain't no big deal. Because right. once you felt the power of the Holy Ghost, they want nothing else satisfy you. Just give them a little time. Because brother, brother Doyle, it ain't how it is. It's how it's going to be. It ain't how it is. And let me tell you something. If I got a strong enough vision, I can come in here by myself every morning, bring my podium down here, crack open my Bible, and begin to preach a revival and anointed messages to empty pews. If my vision becomes strong enough. Because no longer am I relying on the amen of those that are here. I'm believing in the amen of those that are coming. Amen. Let's stand. By two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have. Everybody say, we have. we have. Not you have. Not they have. We have. Hope we have as an anchor of the soul. We got to get a walk with God. I don't even know if they got these anymore. But they used to have these little deals. You could buy them and you blow them up. And they sent boxing gloves with them. They had sand down in the bottom of them. they stand up about that tall, and you could, bam, and hit them hard as you wanted to, and they'd wobble, 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 and then pop right back up. That's the kind of walk with God I'm looking for. I know I'm going to take some hits.